guys. Happy Wednesday. This is episode 24 of Worrying Wednesday, um, and I am Amanda Mercer with his collection. Okay, let's dive into to the word for this week. Just a little um, uh, forewarning. It's going to get a little uncomfortable, y'all. Okay? All right. Sending up favor for eternal righteousness. I'm going to read that again. Sending up favor for eternal righteousness. Suffer. Suffer with me and for me. For it is through your suffering you are being pruned. The thorns and thistles are being removed from the garden of your heart. So you will begin to identify with mine. There is no glory without pain and suffering. Suffering is how we overcome, overcome the obstacles which mean to set us back or keep us stagnant. Do not turn back when moments of suffering come your way, but step forward, come through them, knowing I am with you during each step you take toward me. That is where your suffering will take you. It is a straight line to my heart, my kingdom, and my thinking. I waste nothing and work all things for your good. So when your seasons of suffering come, thank me holding, oh, thank me holding, hold on to me, and seek my face like never before. I am faithful to, to reveal myself to you. For blessed are those pure of heart, for they shall see the face of God. Purify your heart by walking through the fire of refinement, which I send through trials, tribulations, and circumstances. I will not forsake you during those times, but will be even closer. Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. Are you ready to walk with me? No matter where I take you. Love, Abba. Okay. <laughs> so look, suffering is not a popular topic, right? It's something that the majority of us try to avoid whenever possible. Um, we tend to, you know, create our lives in such a way to where we, we cut pain out of the box, right? We try to do whatever is necessary to ensure that we're removing pain, that we're removing, removing suffering, that we're taking ourselves out of maybe situations or relationships that are going to lead to that. But that is such a worldly thinking, right? That's us taking our fleshly kind of down here looking left and right you know and really that inward selfish thought process and trying to remove it when God is looking down from above at the entire scene seeing it from beginning to end right he's seeing your life uh, the life of the person who's you know maybe causing some trial or tribulation in your life or the circumstance or whatever the trial may be he's seeing it from beginning to end the whole story and he's loving every person involved, right? He's loving each of them. So his mindset from up here, his thinking is completely different from ours down here where we're seeing out of our flesh the majority of the time and we're just looking here, right? We're looking left, we're looking right, and we're seeing a situation that way. Whereas God, remember his ways are higher, his thinking is higher, right? The heaven is higher. So he's coming up from here, looking down and seeing it play out, which is why in our natural world, right, in the flesh, we tend to try to avoid pain and suffering at almost all cost. But it's actually through those times, through those hardships, through those seasons that we are being refined because we are given opportunity to share in the suffering that Christ endured for us which in turn is helping us to get out of ourselves, to get out of our mind, our will, and our emotions, and to come up, right? To come up into the identity of, of God, of Christ, and looking at a situation through that. So 
let's read some scripture that actually backs up um, what we heard in, in the initial reading. Okay, and we're going to jump around a lot here, but let's just start off with looking at 1 Peter 4, um, the very beginning. 1 Peter 4, 1, I am reading out of the New Living Translation today. All right, so then, since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourselves with the same attitude he had and be ready to suffer too. For if you have suffered physically for Christ, you have finished with sin. You won't spend the rest of your lives chasing your own desires, but you will be anxious to do the will of God. All right, look at that, guys. I read from uh, 1 Peter 4, 1, uh, 1 to 2. So look at what it tells us suffering is doing there. Suffering is actually helping us to get rid of desires in us that are not of God and to quicken our like our desire to do the will of God, which isn't that why we're here, right? Why was Jesus sent? He was here to do the will of his father. And if we are to live lives that mimic that of Jesus, if we are to be a reflection of him, then we too are called to, to do the will of the father. So suffering is actually a way for us to rid ourselves of our selfish desires and come up under the will of the Father's desires. And it's going to cultivate that heart in us that's excited to do His will over our will. Okay, let's jump down to 1 Peter 4, 12. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through, as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. All right, so here we go again, right? Another fantastic example of saying how, look, don't be surprised when suffering comes. It's going to come. And through that, we need to be thankful. We need to thank God for what's going on. We need to cry out, even if you don't feel it, right? Even if in your heart, it's not totally there yet. If you're still, we might be speaking out of hard hearts, but there is power in our words. And so if we begin to speak out the word of God and what he is telling us to do here, then it that will begin to manifest in our hearts. Where it was once hard, it will begin to soften. So whether it's over a person, a situation, um, a job, a circumstance, whatever it may be that is currently causing your season of suffering or your trial or tribulation, your heart will actually begin to soften toward that person, situation, circumstance, uh, trial, because you're going to actually begin to identify with the thoughts um, and the ways of God, right? You're going to stop looking at it at this kind of very linear perspective. And you're going to begin to come up and look down and see it airily, aerial, aerially. <laughs> um, you're going to see it from above. Okay, let's jump over. First Peter 4, 19. So if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right. And trust your lives to God who created you, for he will never fail you. Okay, I'm going to flip back um, and just some quick ones, right? I'm on 1 Peter 3, uh, 14. But even if you suffer for doing what is right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their hearts. Instead, you must worship Christ as your Lord, your life. Jump down, 1 Peter 3, 18. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. Let's jump back to James. We have read this so many times. Um, I always, it's always a little tough to find James because it's so short. Uh, okay, James 1, right? We know that in James 1, we are to count it all joy, my brother. Oh, there it is. Okay, James 1. Dear brothers and sisters, when trouble comes your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Okay, let's jump back to Romans 5. We've read this numerous times too if you've been following along in these. Um, we can, uh, Romans 5, 3. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials for we know that they help us develop endurance. 
and endurance develops strength of character and character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. I really appreciate how this scripture in particular ends on that word love because in the end, right, when we go through these seasons of suffering, the trial, the fire, the tribulation, the circumstance, in the end, when we actually seek God in the midst of that and we turn to God and seek his counsel and seek his face and we begin to hear from God himself, it always leads to love. That is what it leads to in the beginning. Just like Jesus laid down his life for us, he calls us to lay down our life for one another. And that's what's happening when we are going through these seasons of suffering. We are being taught, we are given the opportunity to learn how to lay down our life for others, for a situation, for a circumstance, for a trial. And we then are going to begin to operate at a greater level. We're going to get a greater understanding of what the wisdom of God is um, with this word love. And not that cavalier, like not that, you know, we toss out the word love all the time. I love it. I love it. We heart things on, you know, social media because we love them. We're not talking about that kind of love in scripture, right? We're talking about the kind of love to where if somebody, you know, hits you on one cheek, you turn and you offer them the other, which is the exact opposite of what the world teaches us, right? The world is going to teach you eye for an eye. Oh, they did this to you, then you need to, you know, give it back to them this way. But that is not kingdom thinking. That is worldly thinking. Kingdom thinking, thinking, and scripture teaches us that, you know, if somebody wrongs you, you love them in return. You offer grace and kindness and mercy. You know, if you want to receive mercy from the Father, you have to also be merciful. That's in scripture. Look it up. Uh, so if we're operating from a place to where, oh, well, she did this to me or he did that to me or, you know, it worked out this way, that way, that wasn't unfair. And so now I'm going to, you know, retaliate or I'm going to uh, be vindictive this way or I'm going to, you know, respond out of hate. You are not operating in the spirit. I'm sorry to, to be so blunt here. Actually, I'm not sorry to be so blunt because this is sometimes how we have to hear it. But we're not operating in the spirit when we're responding that way. Now, if you're listening right now and you're like, whoo that's convicting. I know that I have been operating that way. And look, I'm raising my hand. You know, what's um, so uh, beautiful is that as God has me sharing this, uh, these particular messages with you, he's also gifting me opportunity um, to have firsthand testimony of them, to walk it out so that, you know, I can speak from a place of, of understanding and speak from a place to where like, hey, I get it too. Um, quickly, you know, I am currently uh, in a season of suffering. I am currently walking through a valley of a broken dream. And in that, there's a lot of suffering. There's a trial. You know, anger wants to come out of me. Bitterness wants to come out of me. Resent wants to come out of me. That's my flesh. And so God is gifting me the opportunity right now to, to help, like, help um, die to self, help my flesh actually die so that I can be resurrected in Christ and I can see a situation from this aerial view looking down versus right here in the flesh looking left and right and seeing like the effect and the impact on me, right? Because that's the selfish thinking. That's when we get into our own mind and we're just looking at something for the pain and suffering that it's causing us and we're thinking about just ourselves. Guys, think of it this way. What if Jesus was like, you know what? This cross thing really hurts. Like, I don't want to go through that pain. Um, I don't want to endure that. So you know what? I'm just going to skip that part. Like, what would, what would life be like if he thought that way? If he thought in a selfish manner to where he was unwilling to lay down his life for us, we would not be able to experience the, you know, eternal righteousness and the kingdom of heaven. Um, we would not be able to be walking in salvation the way that we are today. And so this whole journey, this whole book, right, is the journey of the dying of the self so that we can come into the alignment with Christ, with God, or with God through Christ, right? He is the way. He is the door. So we get into alignment with God by coming to him through Christ. And if we're going to come to him through Christ, then that means we're also going to suffer as Christ did. 
Um, okay, let's jump back to, let's look at some of the promises because right now it can seem heavy, right? Like, oh gosh, this, this is a lot. I don't want to go through it. You know, we're, we're almost programmed through channels, through schooling, through all sorts of things in our childhood and upbringing um, to, you know, to teach how to avoid pain and suffering. It's all about, you know, uh, prosperity and, and success and all of these things, but it's only in the suffering and the pain that we actually begin to uh, come into the fulfillment, the place of, you know, where Jesus is trying to, uh, to prune us and to, to help us die to self and come to him. All right, so let's look at the promises. So when this stuff comes, right, when we're in these seasons, what can we stand on? Psalm 23 is a fantastic one. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength. He guides me along right paths, bringing honor to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies. You honor me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. All right, let's break down a couple of things here. So one, it says, even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid for you are close beside me. So there, there's that message again, right? Like when we're in the tough seasons, when we're in the seasons of suffering, when we're walking through the valley, the Lord is close to you. He's close to me. He's close to you. He's closer than he is when we're in our, you know, our easy seasons, our seasons of kind of gliding. Um, that's where it actually becomes a little dangerous to backstep, right? Because we don't have to be as dependent on the Lord when everything is going well, which is actually why God allows a lot of this stuff to come into our lives because he wants you on fire for him. He doesn't want you just coasting through your life. He wants you to be on fire for him. And that means that sometimes he's got to put the fire under your rear to get you there. Um, you know, one way or the other, he's going to get us there. Are we going to take the easy way or the hard way? Okay. The second part of this, it's going to be a little com uncomfortable. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. Now your rod and your staff. Okay. So the Lord is our shepherd, right? A shepherd has a rod and a staff. Um, the staff guides, right? The staff kind of tells us, that's one that kind of looks like the question mark, tells us where to go. It guides the sheep, you know, along. Whereas the rod is the rod of correction. That's the rod that the shepherd uses to correct his flock, to get them back in line. And Okay, this is, this is part of it. This is part of the message that's a little uncomfortable, but it's something we all need to hear. Just as parents, we're called to discipline our children out of love, right? We discipline them because we see them starting to stray off course. And our heart for them is to keep them on course because we want what's good for them. And we know what's good for them, right? We have lived more life. We have seen more things. Well, just like we talked about earlier, God's ways are higher. His thinking is higher. He knows more than us. So when he begins to see us veer off course, he will use that rod for our protection. He will correct us. He will show us where we've been wrong so that we can come back into alignment. You know, think about Egypt. You know, Egypt was that whole season and time for the, for the Israelites. That was like the rod, right, of correction that was bringing them back in. Um, Ezekiel, if you read the book of Ezekiel, he prophesies to so many different groups of people about where they have strayed off course, where they have begun to worship false idols, where they have began to, um, you know, to, be, to become murderous, adulterous, slanderous, things like that. And he warns them like, hey, God is going to punish you. He is going to correct you. He's going to cut you off because what he's doing He's not seeking to harm you. He is seeking to correct you and discipline you in such a way that it brings you back in, right? Back into the fold. So he uses that rod of correction to get us back in line. And what's the quickest way to get there? Repentance. The quickest way to get there is repentance. If God 
is showing you something like this, then we humble ourselves. You know, we get down low and we look up high to him and we repent and we tell him, Lord, I repent of that selfish thinking. I repent of that pride. I repent of these, you know, these dark thoughts or this hard heart that I've had. You know, we take ownership for it. We take accountability for it just through the words that we speak to him. And then we ask for his forgiveness, which surely he will give you. But it's that act, that act of accountability, that act of admittance, right? Which is known as repentance that actually um, begins to like, sh like cut the sin off of you, off of your flesh. It helps your flesh die to self. And then Christ begins to fill that space, right? He begins to fill you with the Holy Spirit so that then you're back into alignment. He brings you back into the fold. All right, so um, last bit, let's just reread the acronym. So what does it mean to suffer? Suffering is sending up favor for eternal righteousness. We send up favor by repenting. We send up favor by thanking God, right? Thanking him for the circumstance, the trial, the tribulation. And in return, we receive eternal righteousness. So send up that favor to God. Thank him for the trial, the tribulation, the seasons of suffering that you may be walking out now or in the past. And most importantly, when those seasons come, seek his face. Seek him above all. If you recognize your thoughts are starting to go in a direction that doesn't align with God's word and character, then you get on your knees, you repent of that, and you ask God for help. You uh, you seek him, right, in whatever way you can. Um, and you do that by spending intimate one-on-one -on -one time with him. From his heart to mine to yours, I hope you have a blessed week.